reading through. This may be, I may have resent the same, but I, I can okay. I'm flesh it out a little bit with this. This is the fourth of our lectures, isn't it? Yes, it is. So, okay. It looks good otherwise, but thank you. Thank so you. we are recording, and uh, you're unmuted. And there okay. you go, and here's the clicker right there. Here's the clicker, and this is the microphone. Hello, everybody. And welcome to our fourth Lunchtime Cochrane Seminar. Um, I want to thank Lillian and Lisa for um, setting up our Zoom today and hosting our sessions and publicizing them so well. Uh, we're going to have two speakers today on Cochrane Systematic Reviews and their personal participation in them. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague Marie St. Pierre from the Children's Hospital, where she's a librarian and medical, um, medical information specialist, and she will start our session for today. Thank you so Thanks. much, Marie. Thank you. Oh, and thank you, everyone. So, I'm Marie St. Pierre. I have worked over at Children's Hospital for 24 years. A little bit about my background. Before I became a medical librarian, I was actually a Spanish interpreter in the hospital for about nine years. So that's uh, quite the experience. You get to see both the clinical end of it. I was with the patients, families, and nurses, and doctors. And now the, the more technical and literature side of medicine and healthcare. So my first question is, why have I helped on systematic reviews? Couple of reasons. First of all, there is the need. The staff have come to uh, us librarians for help in either searching for the literature for their reviews and or even helping writing the methods part of the review, for example. There is definitely a, a need. A couple of times before we set up our literature request, our systematic review request form, we would get a literature request and then after the fact, I would find out, oh, that's really a systematic review. I would send somebody my results and I would get a mysterious email back saying, oh, could I have a Prisma diagram to go with that? I'm like, oh, you needed an actual systematic review. I was not informed of that. So let's go back, do it systematically, get you the real info that you need. Life is good. We actually then started to put an actual request form on our library website. You sign in, you fill in the, the parameters of your topic, your due date, things like that. We librarians receive that information and converse with you. Say, um, we have a sit down meeting in all cases now. And we have a, a standard set of questions that we ask to the researchers, kind of to get us going and it's what's the specific literature that you're, you're really looking for for this review. Which databases are you going to be needing? What keywords are we searching? Are there any other points that we should know about the topic? Odd vocabulary, odd names for a treatment, for example, that we don't know about. Things like that. So we have a sit down meeting um, about an hour or so. So over time, we have indeed done several literature searches and helping to write the Prisma part. The the actual search methodology part of uh, systematic reviews over the years. Um, I have two that have actually been published that I know of, and I'll get a little more detail about that in a little bit. And various departments have asked for a, a systematic review. So it's not limited to one type of department or another. We've had, I believe, nurses ask us for a systematic review, physical therapists or occupational therapists, and of course our physicians. A couple of stats for me personally, I'm a fledgling. Um, over time I've done approximately 17 systematic review requests, worked on the literature part and given the person who asked me their information that I found. Eight of these were actual true formal systematic review requests, and two that I've confirmed have been published. We have a children's a handshake agreement that we librarians would be notified that the review is published, and we ask that we be considered a co-author. 
couple of specifics again, sit down meeting, series of emails. Once one of them was an email, uh, trail. Again, setting search terms, agreeing on the time frame for their project, that sort of thing. That's kind of important. We need a certain amount of time. We need to, we librarians clear our calendars, we sit down, we actually work through a, the search strategy. Two documents I send back to the author. This is kind of coming from me. Other libraries may have a different way of doing this. I send back two documents to the authors. One being the document detailing the search strategy, the n a specific number of results, that sort of thing. And one of them is an EndNote library. Uh, everyone that I've worked with has so far requested EndNote as their official library of choice. So the Prisma document that I work on, a couple of things, a search strategy in each database, clearly in your systematic review, you want it to be consistent throughout the various databases that you choose. However, not all databases have every way of searching. For example, not all databases may have mesh terms, things like that. Not all databases have the exact functionality of the Boolean logic with the ands and ors and nots, that sort of thing. So each one, although we try for extreme consistency, each one may wind up being slightly different. Uh, again, the number of results. First pass exclusions. If I, as your librarian, see that this article just simply does not fit the topic, I just know it does not. That's just a, a hard first pass exclusion. And I record number of duplicates because at the end of looking at all of those articles that come up, there may not be that many in EndNote. EndNote automatically kind of helps deduplicate. So. Those are the things that I especially concentrate on when I'm working on the, the, di the Prisma document. A couple of considerations. Again, we ask that we be uh, mentioned as a co-author or some sort of other uh, acknowledgement of our services and follow up with the authors on the status of the publications. So for example, the two that I've worked on uh, by email, I was notified uh, from the authors when the actual documents were were um, published. I'll tell a little bit about, oops, go back, a little bit about each one just briefly and then please let me know if any questions, anything like that. So the two that I've worked on, one is for the World Health Organization. Serling Chua uh, is a uh, doctor in England and she was working on World Health report on uh, treatments for HIV, papular, pruritic, eruption, and or eosinophilic folliculitis. I hope I'm pronouncing those correctly. So as you can see, that was a rather large subject, but the treatments, as I recall, were fairly specific, two or three different medicines, so that narrowed it down nicely. Um, some of the considerations for exclusions in there were perhaps uh, foreign languages, things like that. Uh, time frame. It was this a new drug that had only been uh, listed for use in the past few years, that sort of thing. I recall that time was a little bit of a factor. The second one that I worked on was a systematic review on sacral nerve stimulation in treatment of constipation and or fecal incontinence in children with an emphasis on interictal malformation. So I'm like, that's quite the topic, uh, too much information. But, of course, it's interesting, uh, the, the sacral nerve stimulation, I did not know uh, such a thing existed, so I briefed myself on that. What is that? What type of literature is out there about that? And this type of review, logically, age was a factor. The children is a sport, pediatric, hospital of pediatric, uh, shall we say, journal. So that was definitely one of the factors that was uh, most important in that. Um, a couple of other things to note along the way. Uh, oddly enough, I did one completely by email. Uh, Dr. Delavelle and uh, Kristen DeSanto, one of the librarians here at uh, Strauss, introduced me by email to her. And all of our question and answers, what are your exclusions and inclusions, what databases should we use, and so forth. And my replies back 
completely by email, my Prisma diagram, the, the document with the endnote, of course, entirely not a problem. It actually worked fairly well that it was done by email. The other document, um, again, we had a sit down meeting for about an hour. We discussed the different uh, databases. Again, we discussed the different vocabulary that would be needed, things like that. And kept in touch simply by email after that, although we would perhaps meet, we met maybe perhaps once after that just to finalize and make sure everything was was on board from my end. Okay, so I know that's kind of a, a very brief. I humbly say again, I've only had two to my credit so far. Um, any questions or comments? Anything else that I could uh, expand on? Maybe you want to just talk a little bit about Prisma, what that is, and why it's important to have a search for Prisma. Excellent. The Prisma, and I apologize for forgetting what the initials stand for, but the Prisma diagram is, is uh, the, the diagram that kind of details your methodology of the literature searching. How do you search for the different articles? Exactly what are your keywords? Which uh, databases you're going to use? Again, I kind of detailed, okay, we searched in this database. This is the exact search term I used, exact words. This is the number of hits that I got. This is the number of articles that were selected. The importance there is that this methodology, this prisma, can be replicated again in a year, two years, if the researcher is wondering if new documents have been published about, new articles have been published about this topic. Things like that. The, it helps with the reproducibility of the research. Yeah, so I, I looked up, I, did, I couldn't remember the oh. name, what it stood for either, so I looked it up on okay. Google here. Okay. Preferred reporting items for systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Excellent. That's what PRISMA stands for. And then the, it's a checklist uh, of uh, things that you should report. So obviously how you do your search is an important part of your systematic review. Exactly. And then the, the authors, um, perhaps not myself as the librarian, but the authors then would also probably include in the PRISMA articles that they included or excluded, uh, why, why not, that sort of thing. The methodology, a more de just a quick detail of what was done. In what form is that? Is that just text in the Word document? Or? Really could be almost anything. I use, I, I simply have, uh, use text in a Word document. I know that's kind of the low tech. Um, but I think that that would be just between, between the researchers to decide how they want that information. And then that information can then be written up into the article in Again, yet another way, their preferred way of detailing it in the actual writing of the article. So I try to send my information in a, a fairly streamlined fashion so that they can use it in any way then that they prefer to actually write it up in the methods part of the article. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Marie. And uh, so I'm the other talk speaker today. Let me see if I can figure out how to get to my slides. I'm in there? Okay. Thank you for your help, Lillian. And maybe while we're waiting to get my slides up, if we could all introduce ourselves to a small group in the room. So I'm Bob Delavalle. I'm the director of the uh, Cochrane Colorado affiliate that just started up here about four months ago. I'm also a dermatologist at the VA and my interest is in skin diseases. Um, Marie, we've heard from. If we could uh, just have people introduce themselves in the audience. We're a small group here. Switch fire. I'm Bruce Morris. I'm a construction designer with Echo Colorado. Tim Pavlik, I work in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health and Wellness Program. I do research and policy. Great. And, and I'm Lillian Hoffaker. I'm a, a searcher here at the library and I do systematic review searches just like Marie. True. We have actually a number of Zoom audience oh. members as well. I don't Are know they able to introduce themselves? Uh, let's see if I. Uh, 
They can hear you. They can um, hear they're you. All <laughs> unmuted. They're all muted, though. Okay. Um, and I don't know if they want to. Does anyone want to unmute yourself in the, uh, in the internet universe out there to tell us who's listening in? Certainly put a, a message in the chat. Okay. If you to Please put a message in your in the chat uh, if you have time there. Uh, and let us know who you are. So I'm going to be talking about my uh, Cochrane Systematic Review experiences today, and I just have the interest to declare that I'm a uh, joint coordinating editor for the Cochrane Skin Group. So that's one of the 53 review groups within Cochrane. And I'm going to be doing my PowerPoint today using some of the principles advocated by David Phillips, uh, who has a terrific YouTube uh, TED Med Stockholm uh, video on how to avoid death by PowerPoint. So I highly recommend taking well, a look at that. I'm sorry to interrupt. There's one person who introduced himself. Great. Um, Joel Begay, data manager and analyst with the life course epidemiology of adiposity and diabetes in the lead center. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Joel, for introducing yourself and joining us today. So my path through my Cochrane review experience was a little bit like this road, uh, kind of meandering back and forth for a very long time, but eventually reaching its goal. Uh, I'm going to start way, way back when I was born in uh, Central California, I grew up in a town called Madera, California, and that's the courthouse of the town where I grew up. And I grew up on a vineyard there, and there's ample sunshine in Madera, California. It reaches 105 degrees routinely in the summertime, no rain until maybe November on average. And these are my parents. Uh, they're no longer alive, but my mom uh, was well known for having uh, very few wrinkles. And the reason she had very few wrinkles is she was a strong advocate of sun protection throughout her whole life. And she would always tell us all to wear hats. I still wear a hat to this day and think of her and not go out in the sun and get sunburned. So uh, fast forward ahead to when I'm going off to college at UCLA. And I have a roommate who says, let's go down to the Santa Monica Beach. I said, sure, that sounds like fun. So we go in the middle of the day, wear no sunscreen for a couple of hours. And I ended up with my first blistering sunburn, my first and only blistering sunburn. This is not my shoulder. This is somebody else on the internet. Uh, I didn't document my own sunburn. But that was enough to get me to emphasize again to me the importance of sun protection. And not only for preventing wrinkles and keeping you looking younger, but also for preventing skin cancer. So fast forward a little bit more to when I came to the University of Colorado to do my dermatology training. And I was uh, helped greatly by the people on this slide. Uh, the first person at the top is Lisa Schilling. So that's my wife and also professor of medicine here. And she pointed out to me that one of the most dangerous diseases in dermatology, melanoma, was reported to be of lower incidence in a number in two large clinical trials of medications that were being used for heart disease prevention. So we got to thinking, well, maybe there's a connection between uh, affecting lipids or fibrates and lowering those uh, lipids or fibrates with statins or fibrates and reducing the incidence of other cancers like possibly melanoma. Uh, also of help to me were David Norris, the current chair of dermatology, uh, Dick Hammond, the first dean of the School of Public Health, and Tim Byers, uh, a professor of preventive medicine. And they formed my committee on my Masters of Public Health. And the topic was, looking at whether or not fibrates and statins would prevent melanoma. So this was just uh, some of the incidents by year. So we have year across the bottom and incidents for 100,000 persons in the US. Males are higher in melanoma, getting more melanoma than females. 
this incidence is still holding true, even though this data only goes to about 2002. So you can see it's increasing. So the thought was, how do we prevent people who have lots of moles that might turn into a melanoma from having that happen? How can we prevent that? So one way to prevent it is with sunscreen, but it's not very, um, not very easy to do that. And also there's some conflicting data now on whether or not sunscreen actually prevents skin cancer. That's probably a, uh, a bit of a muddle because people who are most likely to get skin cancer are also most likely to use sunscreen. So that's probably a, a confounding factor for those studies. But anyway, we were looking for a, another way to prevent, prevent skin cancer than using sunscreens. So again, that brought us around to those two large uh, trials of medications that reduce heart disease. The one is the AFCAP study uh, that used statins for five years. And the people who were in the statin a wing of that study versus the arm that did not receive statins had about half as many melanomas over their uh, time in the study. The other study was a VA study of gemfibrozole for the prevention of, of uh, heart disease, and that again was another very high quality five-year study, and that showed that the people getting gemfibrozole were about one-tenth as likely to have melanoma as uh, the people not getting it. So would that be enough to just draw our conclusions? Well, it turned out there were a lot of other large, randomized, controlled, high-quality trials of these two agents that did not report whether or not the people in the experimental and control arms got melanoma. So the idea for my thesis uh, in public health was to write to all of these clinical trialists and get that data so that we had a comprehensive total view of all the clinical trials of these two agents in cardiology to see if they uh, had lower melanoma incidence. And our initial, I, I employed uh, the help of Dr. Schilling in doing this. And when we wrote initially to all of the trialists, none of them responded. So it was very devastating to have all these cardiac trialists not respond to what we thought was a very important uh, inquiry about whether or not statins or fibrates affected melanoma rates. And why would they be capturing cancer rates in their trials to begin with? Well, it turned out when you gave statins or fibrates to mice, they ended up getting liver cancer. So there was a major concern of when you gave those agents to humans, would you also get humans getting liver cancer? So all cancers were very well captured in these trials. So we thought the data was out there, but we weren't getting to it because of this impasse. So at that point, I contacted Hal Williams, who is a dermatologist in England who leads the Cochrane skin, skin group there, who, who led it from 1997 until 2018. He just recently stepped down. And our strategy was to get the Cochrane involved in helping us get the data from the researchers, because a lot of cardiology trials have been summarized in meta-analyses using the Cochrane cardiac group. And we thought if they saw Cochrane on the letterhead instead of University of Colorado, the trialists might be more inclined to reply to us. We were also able to get a small grant to pay for every incident melanoma in these trials for the, for the trialists to go back and, and get that data, to help fund them going back and getting that data. So with the help of Hal Williams and the Cochrane Skin Group and that small grant that I think paid $50 per incident melanoma in either arm of these trials, we were able to uh, obtain data from the majority of randomized control trials of these agents and uh, that had only statins or fibrates in one arm or the other that were at least four years uh, long. And this was the, in essence, our review that we uh, did in the Cochrane statins and fibrates for the prevention of melanoma. And we were able to get the results from over 62,000 patients. And when we looked at those results, 
we no longer saw a significant association of statins or fibrates with a reduction of melanoma. Now, why is that the case, or why might that be the case? Well, it turned out that the trials that found an association published it, and the other trials that didn't find it did not publish it. So then when we looked at all the data, we no longer had our magic bullet of statins or fibrates uh, reducing the incidence of melanoma, even though there are in vitro trials of statins and fibrates inhibiting melanoma uh, cells in the lab. So that has been my one and only Cochrane systematic review that's been published. But I'm currently working on my second, and this is a uh, review of systematic treatments for eczema. So this is a more standard type of Cochrane systematic review of instead of a, a medication to prevent a disease, a medication being used to treat a disease. And uh, at this point, the protocol is published, so we've said how we're going to do the systematic review, and we are currently pulling the articles and pulling the data to actually do the review. Now, this is one of the review topics that was prioritized. So this is very different from back in the early 2000s when I was doing my first systematic review. Cochrane Skin Group and other Cochrane groups now have been tasked with prioritizing which reviews they think are the most important for their topics. And uh, that is because we have an epidemic of systematic reviews, many of them poor quality, uh, but it's, it's now recognized that we can't do systematic reviews on every topic because it's just too much work and that we have to prioritize those research efforts. So this is one of the five or six topics that was prioritized. Uh, groups of authors can compete, at least in Cochrane Skin, for the ability to take on that topic as a team. And if they're selected, they're supported by the editorial unit. And that's where we are with that uh, eczema uh, treatment systematic review. We hope to have that uh, wrapped up in the coming year. Now, just a little bit about the timeline, which I conveniently omitted from my first systematic review. It was a, about a six-year timeline from starting the review, doing the searches, pulling the data, and then getting it published in the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, and then also a co-publication in the journal of the NCI. So this is, uh, sometimes things aren't what you think they're going to be, but you have kind of an idea of what they're going to be like, and that's how I felt like uh, my experience with Cochrane Systematic Reviews were. This is a, pure, a picture of a scientist from the RAND Corporation predicting what the home computer would look like. Um, so this is back in the 50s, and uh, they were thinking the home computer would look like this in 2005. So they got a few things right. They have the, uh, the printer, that's pretty good, and the monitor, and, and this is the mouse, uh, and this is the computer. So the computer is a lot smaller, the mouse is a lot smaller, but they, the basic components were there. And that's sort of what I thought uh, my experience with the Cochrane Systematic Review was. The, the components were there, but some of them were much more uh, gangly than, than, they, uh, than I might have hoped or imagined. So it's a journey to do a systematic review. Uh, this is a picture of some of our Colorado mountains. That journey is going to benefit from the help of others and mentorship of people along the way. And hopefully some of the people in this group will be able to help others. Uh, uh, my mentor for my PhD, Susan Lindquist, will always say when you uh, hear of a topic or a area that you want to investigate, you're going to know when you, when you found it. The inner voice is going to speak to you and say, yes, that's where your passion is, that's what you want to go for. And that was my case with the systematic review. It required a lot of work from a lot of people. And uh, with those people, we were able to climb mountains of paper at that time. And these are just some of the collaborators that uh, helped. I wanted to name again uh, Lisa Schilling and then um, Amanda Schultz and um, and uh, Dr. Freeman. Um, 
those were key players in, in getting this uh, published. And of course, thank all the patients who have made this an important topic for dermatologists over the years to work on. So I'll thank you for your attention and open it up for questions now. This is a picture of our maroon bells up in Aspen. They might be looking like that right now, so I haven't been up to see them. Has, has anybody been up to see if they're looking that good right now? They, they weren't in Aspen, so that's okay. just, just a couple trees or she lost starting to <laughs> my little whole life. Um, the bit that I've uh, communicated with Cochrane to do one of their studies, it's it's fairly well spelled out, is it not? There's a whole entire, there's a workbook, there's, this, I forget if Cochrane has um, a specific software to do the bibliographies, that sort of thing. Yeah, we used EndNote, again, when we were doing ours way back then. I don't know if people are using it now. There are other tools that are being used for systematic reviews. Covidence is one, and uh, I forget the name of another. Um, there is a handbook for Cochrane reviews that helps determine how you can do them. And uh, one of the authors of that handbook, <clears throat> Tanjing Li, has recently been recruited to our campus to the uh, ophthalmology department and hopefully we'll get, be getting her in to talk at one of these sessions soon. She starts October 1st and she was also at the U.S. Cochrane Center uh, in Maryland before it uh, folded a few years ago. Um, so we're looking forward to having her on campus and enjoying her experience and leadership as well in these areas. But they, they have developed a lot of things. Um, there's RevMan and RevMan Web are the, um, so Webman was a computer program for doing systematic reviews, and now Webman Rev, Rev is a web-based version of that program uh, that people are using in Cochrane. There's also a tool for determining um, bias, uh, the review of bias two tool, so that one helps determine how biased the studies that you're putting into the review are. And that is generating a lot of excitement and uh, commotion in, in Cochrane right now. And the Redman that has sort of a a tiebreaker function. If if all of the researchers on a particular review are looking at the different articles and they're saying yes, let's use this article, one says no, let's not. Or person, you know, it, it kind of you can you communicate with each other that way too. And choosing the especially probably helpful if you have like a whole ton of articles. That you found. Mm -hmm. kind of that you yeah, and um, I have to thank Marla Graber, who is also the li librarian who helped us with this, and it was Scott Freeman as the, the other person. So, um, yeah, and another question? Yeah, a few questions. Sure. <laughs> Just you know, briefly, uh, the size of the team, is that typical? For yeah, the size of the team is usually about seven. I'd say on I haven't looked, I'd say six or seven. So you have uh, usually a lead author, a senior author with experience of systematic reviews. You usually have some people doing the front of the work. Who are the first authors? You have a librarian, at least one. You usually have a methodologist or a statistician. So I get you to about five. A couple others. Yeah. And a couple others. Yeah. Six years. Uh, I think the average now is four years and dropping. And a major emphasis is reducing the amount of time uh, that it takes to do a systematic review by hopefully mechanizing a lot of these uh, steps, like doing the search, mechanizing the search, mechanizing the selection of, uh, of articles that uh, fit the criteria for the um, review, and coming up with other ways to optimize the uh, the production. Also limiting the number of systematic reviews being worked on by editorial teams through prioritization so that everybody's not spread too thin. And then uh, the databases you guys are switching against, is this just like vanilla, like PubMed, uh, Embase, Web of Science, or anything exotic that you're going into that? Uh, Marie might be able to talk more to which databases could be looked at. There are quite a few of them. Yeah. And um, Oftentimes, ideally, the Cochrane reviewers do not like to include a language restriction, which means you could get a lot of Chinese articles and Spanish, and 
the Cochrane does help with tr the translation of those. Uh, so ideally, they like to search all of the literature that's possible to include the best ones from around the world, no matter where they've been performed and what language they're in. And the last question, um, you know, you kind of alluded to it a couple of times now that uh, we're trying to um, you know, reduce the number of systematic reviews that we're working on, and that there is a large pool of ideas, it sounds like, and then you kind of focus on the best ones. How do I know if my idea is like, good enough? Because you know? I've got to do some, I have to invest some groundwork on my end to even kind of figure out if this is even a possibility. You know? Right, so the best thing, um, one approach might be to do a non systematic, quick review of Met, PubMed or, or the literature with a librarian to see what's out there in terms of uh, information for your answering your question and see how good the quality is and if there's a lot of complex information that would benefit for answering an important question that hasn't been synthesized well yet so an example i can give you in dermatology is there are a ton of new medications biologics coming out to treat psoriasis and they have different targets, and they're all about sixty thousand dollars each. So, which one's the best? Which one's the best? What's the best evidence comparing them? So, there's something called network meta-analysis. That even though two drugs haven't been compared to each other, if they've each been compared to a third drug, you can triangulate how good they might be. So, we have a network meta-analysis doing that for system at, for the systematic review of psoriasis drugs, being done by our colleagues in France. And in addition to doing the network analysis, they're also trying to make it a living systematic review, meaning that it's going to be updated monthly so that any new studies that would affect that network comparison could be added pretty quickly. And that takes a ton of effort, and, and that's a real cutting edge approach. Just during the, the project, or once we move even after? After, yeah, it's living, so it's like never done. It's like alive every month checking and adding and changing. <laughs> Lillian. So I have a couple of questions, but I also wanted to add another person. Sure. Who, um, identified herself, uh, Shannon Archuleta, research assistant at the Rocky Mountain VA, M-I-R-E-C-C. -C. Oh yeah, welcome Shannon. That's, that's my home institution. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, the questions I had was about um, the you said there was like a competition to, to get the um, prioritized. Um, yeah. So I can just speak to that for my review group, which is SKIN. So we did our first prioritization of review topics back in 2017, and we're doing it again next year in 2020. And what it entailed was uh, finding out uh, what the global burden of skin disease was and where the biggest burden of disease was. And then also finding out from key stakeholders like the American Academy of Dermatology and the British Academy of Dermatology what they thought were the biggest problems in dermatology that needed to be answered. And just sort of putting it all together and thinking about it uh, and coming up with a list of five or six topics that were then advertised uh, for authorship teams. And then uh, people applied and, and got those, prior got those uh, reviews. Unfortunately, it hasn't led to, we were hoping that we would get very quick production of um, systematic reviews, and I think only one of the six has been published yet over a two-year period. So again, we're running into that, uh, that problem of not being able to do a very complex, uh, high-quality systematic review very quickly. And where were they advertised for the website? Yeah, so um, ours were advertised uh, via the Cochrane um, email network and via the website for Cochrane Skin. So Cochrane has about 25,000 members around the globe that uh, maybe read their email, I don't know. <laughs> maybe come to lunchtime meetings and uh, hear about stuff like this. So. Uh, it was enough to get four or five teams to apply for each title. So there were um, a number of people who wanted to do the work. And whether or not the right teams were selected is another question because it, it hasn't uh, <laughs> led to the, the end result that we were hoping of quick uh, systematic reviews of high quality on these high priority topics yet. So we're still learning. So my impression of how these work 
a person who reads a lot of them, <laughs> is that um, you, your primary source material is really the published paper. But in, in your story, you were talking about going back to the original trialists, getting their actual data. And that sounds like a genius way of overcoming some of that publishing publication bias bubble and how it's going to affect your yeah. effect. Uh, on the other hand, that, that's like a lot of additional work. So I mean, is that is that, is that an, if you if, it's one thing if you if you come back with nine or ten or twelve results and you spend some time reproducing, trying to reproduce that data or that finding. It's another if you get a few dozen. I mean, is, are you just bringing in more people when you decide to go that route, or are you just deciding at the beginning whether or not you're going to do that at all? Um, well, what you do is you you write the protocol and publish the protocol of how you're going to do the systematic review. So in that protocol, you would say what databases you're going to search, how you're going to search them, whether you're going to restrict to a language, whether you're going to try to get individual patient data from researchers who have published these trials. So we were kind of pioneers in terms of using individual patient data for a systematic review back then. That's another uh, development that's currently considered cutting edge uh, uh, methodology for a systematic review. So if you had unlimited resources, you would go back to the original data for all of the uh, systematic reviews, and you would only do them on high priority topics, and you would do network living meta-analysis. So you can see that all of these things are where we hope to be someday, maybe with the help of AI, and uh, we have the ideal, some ideals out there that we aren't currently doing because of a number of barriers. One is the security issues with getting to individual patient data have probably increased from the time that we did it back in early 2000s. Um, but other things have, have become easier, so uh, the power of computers have become much better. So, so in that protocol, if you said like, you, know, it's, uh, you want to get all the original data you can, is that become exclusionary? Like, if, if, the, if the original authors don't submit that to you, then you're like, well, then we can't use the... Depends, depends on how you write the protocol. And your protocol, you can write it, but then it's peer reviewed. So if the peer reviewers say, this is ridiculous, you can't re exclude a trial because you haven't gotten the individual patient data. So there are a number of peer review uh, steps for each step in the process. And I wish I had the sl slide up of all of the steps in the process of doing a Cochrane review, but uh, first you get the title, then you get the uh, protocol written, reviewed, published, then you do the review and you get that reviewed and published. And then you're supposed to uh, renew it or check it every two years. So, so that it stays forever, forever and ever. <laughs> or else it gets retired. Yeah. Uh, meaning that the world knows it's not being checked every two years. And ours is now retired because we're not checking all that data every two years on the uh, fib rates and uh, statins for the for meta, for, uh, meta analysis. And they actually use the word withdrawn, which uh, I don't like because that implies that something might have been wrong right. in the original one. But that's the, if you look at uh, the Cochrane Library, they, they use the term withdrawn for a systematic review that's not being updated. And uh, we've, We've argued strongly for them to change that terminology well, I have too. A couple of my, my collection here that have been withdrawn and then replaced by like a newer one, and then you're like trying to figure out like what the lineage break was between the two. Yeah, it's probably the authorship team didn't have the resources to keep doing the work, and another authorship team came along and decided it was an important topic that needed to be updated, and they didn't for some reason uh, continue to update the one that was done originally. So on the the use of the term slash for keywords, um, yeah, I, you have a great suggestion there with doing the initial, like just the old school, like pull down as many articles as you can, look through what's in there, think, try to refine your search as much as you can before you talk to the professionals. What if you still made a mistake? You get a really great, fairly objective culling of all the all the uh, research that's out there. You read something you didn't find in your original culling, like oh man, I should have that search term. Is that are we redoing the whole search from scratch, or we just get, is there a way to manipulate that new search to get that new yeah. branch of the tree? If, if you do get your protocol published, you can always, and you, do, you end up doing something differently for the systematic review, you can always put in your justification of why you did that, and if the peer reviewers agree that that was a good idea, it really was a study that should have been included and wasn't, in, for some reason, pulled by the search or the um, inclusion criteria, uh, that sounds like reasonable enough uh, uh, 
justification to have that included in the systematic review without any problem. There's always areas of you know debate and, and differences of opinions on, on things, and that's why uh, systematic reviews do not always give the same results. Right. Uh, well, I just, since both of you were talking about uh, systematic reviews that were focused on randomized control trials, um, I'm wondering where where the, where's the decision made that you're going to do a systematic review and not an actual meta analysis of the data? Since at that point you should be looking at or will be a preponderance of people using the same methods to find out. Yeah, so systematic reviews are looking at all of the data and then not always can you meta-analyze, not always can you combine that data. So meta-analyses are a subset of right. systematic reviews. I was wondering how you make, if you, is it you, like you're just like, I just know there's enough that they have similar enough designs, similar enough to the graphics, whatever it is that you're like, we're going to do in the main instead, or is it like, I don't know, if you're further into the systematic review process, you're like, this would be a, this is a future project. I'm going to look in these 29 <laughs> articles and redo a search for an MA. Yeah. So, Marie, do you have a? And I would say, again, it's kind of based on the stats and numbers. Is this something that can be then you, is there enough information to do the meta-analysis, or is it more simply just, no, this is a, a systematic review of yeah, and there are some measures of heterogeneity, uh, how different the studies are for a different topic that you can look at. Uh, but again, that's one of the areas of a difference of opinion. I think systematic reviewers are inclined to meta-analyze anything they possibly can. <laughs> so they're, they're probably uh, on that end of the pendulum of doing it more often than it probably should be done. But... Uh, I can certainly think of uh, systematic reviews for like the treatment of vitiligo that had 29 different papers, none of which could be combined. And in those cases, would within your uh, your statisticians be uh, more help in, in the consulting on that question? Or yeah, that could be a, a right particular one? question for um, statisticians helping on your uh, review. Uh, statisticians. <laughs> Actually, if there's any in the room, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, I really only have, I, I was kind of hoping for a little bit more of like, this is how we do it with the library sort of stuff, but I probably missed that talk because I was at town. We did have that talk last month, I yeah, think. I was, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Kristen so DeSanto so gave it, but it should be uh, recorded uh, uh, and available. So, so you should be you able. I'll question then, and I'll, but I, I, I'll sit here with one other question from my research team, and that is, apparently you have the power, maybe this is a question for you, to search great literature stuff or non peer reviewed stuff as well? Is that a separate database or is that a separate search process altogether? Certainly, yeah, great literature is completely different. Uh, you're searching in um, other areas uh, to, uh, societies may publish right, yeah. things that are not in articles. Yeah, we do a lot of journal, practice based stuff, like a lot of think tank papers like show this our resources because okay. there is no peer reviewed article. Exactly. So, for that, what you would want is, uh, first of all, someone who is experienced in the gray literature and get more familiar. Um, and it can be written into, I would say, it could be written into the search process. Okay, this is the gray literature. We are going to search this, this, and this. Again, using whichever search terms. Um, that sort of thing. So you can do it in a systematic way to include it in a systematic way. But there's no like clearing house or who's yeah. somebody who's collecting all of that stuff. There, there's a data thing called Open Gray and, uh -huh. and, uh, and there used to be the National, National New York Academy of Medicine used to make me the great literature reports and I don't think they um, they, they stopped that. And um, just to define our terms a little bit again, so gray literature is like an abstract for a meeting that isn't then subsequently published in a peer-reviewed journal. So it's, it's that, uh, the reports of things that are... Rigorous analysis, they just don't come out of like an academic body, they won't put the peer-reviewed journal to publish and things like that. Gray has a healthy boundary. So very familiar with the NIH searches for a number of projects, and this one military nurses and, and a lot of it is in great literature. So I'm looking at dissertations, mm -hmm. clinical trials, conference abstracts, society um, societies, um, white white papers from um, CDC, 
um, and other government agencies. And so it's like, unlike PubMed, we can get a lot of things all at once. Like going to so then, if you if, if say you the, what we also just looked at conference abstracts, are you sort of relying on results of the abstracts, or do you then think that will really have a lot of abstracts? It's based on from project to project, it's different. So, some people they say, Oh, yes, especially if it's kind of a cutting edge type of topic, you want those conference abstracts because they haven't had time to right. really publish it. And so, so they'll go through them, and you can just get a ton of these. It's very overwhelming sometimes. Yeah. Um, but so there, there's so the a conference answers from one conference can be overwhelming. <laughs> but it's just a paragraph. Yeah. And so so you could scan it, but usually uh, our authors at least exclude them because there's no data in them. Right. Yeah. But if it's interesting enough, they contact the authors and, and you know, ask if you can get a hold of your data or if they ask questions. We've come to the end of our hour. We're 10 minutes before one. Are there any other questions from anybody in the audience out in, in the internet land? Um, no questions. No question. So at, I want to just uh, warn everybody that our meeting next month is going to be a little bit earlier in the month. It's going to be on Wednesday, October 16th, because the Cochrane Colloquium in Chile will be happening at the end of the month, and a lot of people might be missing because of that, the lucky ones of us. And <clears throat> our topic for the meeting on the 16th, oh, is it the 16th? I think it is. Uh, yeah, Lillian, maybe you can just confirm that before we sign off. Um, should be how to review a systematic review. So, or why might my systematic review be rejected by an editor? So that will be our topic next month and hopefully we'll have Tanjing Lee uh, as one of our speakers for that. So I wanna thank you all for uh, coming today. Please sign the sign-in sheet and we'll try to get you on a listserv if we ever get around to doing that. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you so much, Marie. Oh, did they, did, did your review, I don't know why I'm thinking of this, did you lose control for like hours of sun exposure per day and latitude? I don't know why I'm thinking of that. It just,